If you saw my last video, I talked about how evolution is compatible with theism. I showed that teleology is heavily ingrained in how we understand biology and evolutionary processes. My conclusions were that it is very epistemically friendly towards theism, since theism implies that the metaphysical bedrock of reality is rational and would prefer widespread order over widespread chaos, given order's value. In this video, I will continue in the same vein by giving further thoughts I have concerning evolutionary evils and supposed force that it has as an atheological argument against theism. Let's say the atheologian grants that the present teleology in the processes and mechanisms of evolution confirm theism over naturalism or its rival competitors. There is one issue left to be discussed, however. How does the data of evolutionary evil fare on theism? Many are driven to say that it strongly disconfirms theism, even to the point that it overturns the evidential weight of the biological evolutionary datum itself in the other direction, to naturalism or its rivals. I'm going to provide some critiques of this view and demonstrate why I think the evidential weight of evolution, when all things are considered, still goes to theism. First, what is the data evolutionary evil? There are many ways one could frame this. John R. Schneider formulates the evidential argument from evil in terms of what can be termed Darwinian worlds. A Darwinian world consists of four elements, deep evolutionary time, a plurality of worlds, anti-cosmic micromonsters, and evils inscribed. These are the four main components that can be said to be a problem for theists, but not a problem for atheists. Naturalists will affirm that the Darwinian worlds are prima facie more likely on naturalism than they are on theism, and thus is evidence against theism. I want to spell out what each of these four elements means in appropriate detail, but first, what we are dealing with have commonly been labeled teleological evils. This is a class of natural evils that focuses on the intrinsicality of processes and how our entities come about. More on this when I go over evils inscribed. I want to move on to define the four components mentioned earlier, which are constituents of Darwinian worlds. Deep evolutionary time simply refers to the fact that there are a long history of pre-human species that have lived and died. Humans came about on the scene 2 million years ago, which means that there have been a prior history of roughly 3.98 billion years of organisms evolving and suffering from various circumstances. Plurality of worlds is a phase noted by Schneider that comes from William Wewell that expresses the variety of species that inhabited the Earth in a strangely disparate succession during the planetary past. There were whole worlds, or tribes, that have risen and fallen in the deep evolutionary past, which seems to have broken and unpredictable occurrence that has characteristics of being random and chancy, especially given the mass extinctions that have occurred. 99.5% of all species that have ever walked the earth are gone, most often in a violent, horrific, cataclysmic fashion, many of them without leaving so much of a genetic legacy to generations yet to come. Anti-cosmic micromonsters refers to the unexpected discovery that huge hordes of microbial, viral, and other sorts of monstrous miniature creatures inhabit the earth. These hideously horrific creatures are thought to not reflect a divine direction, and thus act as evidence against theism. Lastly, we have evil inscribed, which is the idea that the driving force of evolution by natural selection and the mechanisms thereof are not due to special creation scenario, but the result of inefficient, wasteful, and brutal processes. This seems to lend to an atheistic intuition that this is not the result of a divine creator. Going over some responses here, when we compare the data of evolutionary suffering on the hypothesis of theism and naturalism, the datum is prima facie in favor of naturalism over theism. This is because the content of naturalism entails that reality is fundamentally indifferent, and so it is not positively against the suffering of animals in the evolutionary processes, horrendous or minimal. The content of theism is, on the other hand, entails realities fundamentally loving, caring, and partial towards the well-being of sentient creatures. So even though naturalism does not exactly predict the distribution, intensity, and frequency of evolutionary suffering, it is less surprising that it has occurred nonetheless than it has on theism. Thus, the datum of evolutionary suffering favors naturalism over theism. The idea here is that theism leads us to a false prediction. Theism should lead us to expect that the only evils that occur are those that are justifiable. In the case of the distribution of evolutionary suffering, we are faced with a history of intense and horrendous sufferings that have befallen creatures, those of the kind that lead to vast languishing and tragedy. We should expect that God would not authorize 
these evils, given that he cares about their well-being and flourishing. Thus, God would want to minimize profusion of evolutionary suffering as much as he can. This is the grounds for us to conclude that the profusion of evolutionary suffering we observe is unjustifiable. I will show that this is simply not the case. For theism to be disconfirmed by the datum of evolutionary suffering, we must list the relevant factors that inform us when we have an instance of unjustifiable evil. The naturalist cannot simply go from a description of intense evolutionary suffering to unjustifiable evil. They must be explicit about the underlying factors they are working with. Here are some. Factor 1. Animals suffer intensely and horrifically over the course of evolutionary history, and their evils are never compensated or defeated. Factor 2. God will only authorize intense and horrific animals' evolutionary suffering if they are necessary, either to prevent a greater evil or bring about a greater good. Otherwise, God will minimize evil as much as is possible. Given these two factors, I can agree with the naturalist that the datum of evolutionary suffering will serve as a disconfirmation. However, the theist is not obligated to agree with the naturalist that these factors are the case. I take what Chisholm, Adams, Doherty, and Schneider say about the provision of defeat of evils and the myth of shared axiology to be correct. Anti-theistic evidential arguments from evil rely on meta-ethical and axiological assumptions about God justifying norms. They rest their background assumption is that God is justified in authorizing evil only when it is necessary. Schneider refers to this background assumption as the moral condition of necessity. This is a normative utilitarian principle that we often impose on other human beings, which are discussed in theoretical ethics. The problem with this assumption is that the theist is not necessarily constrained by it. For the evidential argument from evolutionary suffering to get off the ground, the naturalist and the theist must agree on a shared axiology and its starting point. Otherwise, there are simply no evidential argument from animal suffering to be had. Keep in mind that the naturalist is attempting to show that given the content of theism, that theism leads us to a false prediction about the profusion of evolutionary suffering. But to show that theism falsely predicts the profusion of evolutionary suffering, they must show that the content of theism leads us to expect something else. So they must rely on the content of the theist axiology to be successful. Recall earlier to two factors that could show an instance of unjustifiable evil. If the content of the theist axiology does not include such factors, then the theist can blunt the entirety of the force from the evidential argument from evolutionary suffering. In agreement with Chisholm, Adams, Doherty, and Schneider, I think that the moral condition of defeat is much more fitting God-justifying norm. The condition of defeat states that God is justified in authorizing evil insofar as the evil can ultimately be defeated. This completely does away with the second factor, which renders the naturalist background assumption mute. In respect to the first factor, if the theist can show that the profusion of evolutionary suffering can be expected to and be ultimately defeated on their theory, then that does away with the first factor as well. Now, the naturalist can object and insist that since minimizing intense and horrendous suffering is intrinsically valuable, then God should be motivated to pursue such values. This makes the mistake of assuming that God is motivated by meta-ethical values and not meta-normative ones. It is not necessitating that if an agent perceives that some intrinsic value P, that they ought to pursue P. For it ignores any possibility of an agent overriding meta-normative motivations to pursue some other intrinsically valuable P. Philosopher Michael Kowalik shows what is needed to make those logical connections. He says, it is necessary to show that a some principle, state, relation, or thing p is good or valuable to all possible agents in a given world. b there are reasons to pursue p that would have to be overridingly motivating for any rational and sufficiently informed agent. c for all possible agents, certain actions or attitudes with respect to any other agent amount to either enhancing or diminishing p. More work needs to be done on the part of the naturalist to show that the theist should not believe that God is interested in defeating evils instead of minimizing evils as much as he can. So in principle, any state of affairs where animals suffer profusely and their suffering is defeasible is a state of affairs God is justified in authorizing, and thus we have an instance of justifiable evil, which does not disconfirm theism. Now since the part of the case is primarily a work of theodicy, since I have showed the provision of defeat is a more proper God-justifying moral condition, which serves to screen off disconformatory force 
of the argument from animal evolutionary suffering. What I'm trying to do is elucidate the thesis that the theist can screen off the disconformatory power of arguments from evil, thus rendering one of naturalism's main a posteriori arguments mute. Now, it appears prima facie that some instance of suffering lowers the probability of theism. If the theist has some theodical story where the probability of theism, given the evil and the theodical story, equals the probability of theism, we say that S has screened off the disconformatory power of E from T. So if E was a defeater for T, and S is a defeater defeater, then T goes back to its original probability. A common response is that any theodical story theism utilizes to screen off the discontrolatory power of evil will come at a cost of reducing theism's total probability, in a way that will give a leg up to the naturalist. I think this objection is interesting and worth taking into account, but is misguided. We must first understand what propositions theism entails and how it entails them. My position is that of Doherty's. Theism either entails or nearly entails the doctrines and theodical stories that I am invoking. As theists, I think we are in the best possible spot. The eschatological stories will come at no cost in probability. For my response, I will begin with a trope theoretic model of theism put forth by Joshua C. Jawadi. God, understood as a trope, means that God is the instantiation of an abstract particular nature that is of a modular kind, one that is self-exemplifying. As a trope, God does not possess any properties in the traditional sense, but in the analogous sense, since a trope of a modular kind is numerically identical to its nature. Taking a powers ontology, God, conceived as a trope, is numerically identical to its powers. Powers without limit. A powerful trope with zero limit of a modular kind. Thus, an omnipotence module trope. It also follows that God is metaphysically simple. Many trope theorists are also bundle theorists, that is to say, they view substances as bundles of tropes. God lacks his plurality in him by being a single object. Thus, God is a fundamental and irreducible entity who doesn't have properties in the traditional sense, but is the nature he instantiates. Another interesting aspect about tropes is that they bypass Leibniz's law of indiscernibles. You can have duplicates of tropes exemplified in one object. Since tropes don't exhaust their content, Sijuwadi proposes a way in which I personally think is the most plausible form of intelligibly grounding divine simplicity. Sijuwadi utilizes Donald Baxter's theory of aspectivalism and situates it within a trope theoretic context, thus allowing him to take advantage of bypassing the law of indiscernibles when applying Baxter's work. It's crucial that I briefly go over the nature of Baxterian aspects so that it remains plainly relevant to my response to evidential arguments from evolutionary evil. Aspect theory, as put forth by Baxter, is a theory about qualitative self-differing. When we speak of an entity having aspects, we mean that there is some intrinsic self-differing within them. A straightforward example would be that I am a son, but I'm also a brother. I can simultaneously self-differ in these qualitative ways. They're qualitative because it would be absurd to say that I'm differing in a numerically distinct way. Rather, all of my aspects are numerically identical, but distinct in a qualitative way. This can be true in the nominalist sense as well as the ontological sense. For God, he can have a multiplicity of aspects within him by being an omnipotence trope. This is what bypassing the law of indiscernibles allows us to do locate self-differing aspects in the same object, while remaining numerically identical to its nature. Thus, God is not simply numerically identical to omnipotence, but also numerically identical to goodness. God is omnipotent insofar as he has the power to know all necessary truths about value, and has the power to do best actions, best kinds of actions, and many good actions when present. This applies to the rest of his characteristics as well. Thus, God possesses goodness, not via a relation of entailment, but a relation of identity. Given what I have laid out previously as my model of God, I can address the objection rightly. Since God is numerically identical to his aspect of goodness through being a trope and applying the nature of Baxterian aspects, this means that God is numerically identical to doing best actions or best kinds of actions when present. It inescapably follows that if some action X is a best action, God will do it. It is a necessary consequence of God's nature that he will realize these actions. So, 
for the evidential argument for evolutionary suffering. If we find ourselves in some world W, where W contains an evil E, and the best action for God to take on behalf of E is contained within our theatrical story S, then the probability of S obtaining in W is logically equivalent to God's existence, since God is numerically identical to such best kinds of actions, and thus any occasion where E obtains, S obtains. So, the area S which implies E is equally proportionate to the area of God's existence. Thus, the probability of T and S is logically equivalent to the probability of T. Therefore, the probability of S completely overlaps with the probability of theism. Given this approach, there is no sensible way in which this decreases the total probability. An argument from weighted averages does no epistemic damage to what I have presented. The theoretical story we are telling is guaranteed and is as guaranteed as God being God. Because an afterlife cannot be stripped from theism, given that any world where E obtains, S obtains, an eschatological story about the afterlife compensation and defeat, the only way to show that indefeasible evil has occurred, given that we cannot observe an agent's total life in the afterlife, is to show that the probability of theism itself is lower than naturalism. The probability of an indefeasible evil occurring is thus inscrutable. Since we are epistemically cut off from knowing what an agent's life on the whole is like. This is a very underwhelming consequence for the evolutionary argument from evil, since it forces the proponent to switch from arguing about evil to arguing about the probability of theism in general. Thus, the argument from evolutionary evil cannot be employed as a vehicle of disconfirmation.